Today's episode is sponsored by Paperlike. You know we've talked about Paperlike a lot. We really love their products. They just revamped their cleaning kit and it's so good. I know your iPad is disgusting. It's got crumbs on it. It's got tons and tons of fingerprints. And I bet it's been a while since you've actually cleaned your iPad. This new cleaning kit is a thinner design, so it's way more portable. And it's refillable, which is amazing. The spray bottle fits both ways into the hard gel casing. So you can just slide it in and out. Honestly, the spray is just better. I don't know. It's very satisfying. And I just love that you can refill this. It says it should last you 10 years, which I don't know. Do the math. That's crazy. The cleaning kit is so compact that I'm just going to be throwing it into my pencil case everywhere I go so that it's always with me and my iPad. No more disgusting screen. Honestly, I can't believe I let my iPad get that disgusting. It was so satisfying to clean it. And it's just this one tool where the spray and the wipe is all in one. So it's all you need. You don't have to carry around a cloth or any extra accessories. So grab your new Paperlike cleaning kit version two today. Okay, so, tell us about your colonoscopy. Well, I just want to say <laughs> that if my mic picks up my stomach going like, <laughs> <laughs> I want you guys to know it's not, I'm not farting. It's my stomach. Farting yeah, is welcome. Farting, yeah, I mean, I mean, we talk about all kinds of bodily functions here I'm on here the podcast. I'm so here for it. You know, there was <laughs> maybe a week into working my first job out of college, like my first big girl art director job. We had this one little table in this tiny little room in this tiny little house. And I was with all these new coworkers of mine and my stomach was going it was like the loudest grumbles i've ever had in my life like for the kinds hours. that go like kind of like that almost sound like, it's like fart it was, adjacent it was fart awful adjacent. and i like i felt fine but i was for some reason i decided to go the route of not say anything about it which now i regret i wish i could go back and be like let's just address this because then everybody had to sit in silence and awkwardly hear my stomach and like it was the worst I, I have so many horror stories that I would love to share for you, although I'm not sure your podcast is where you want them. But I will do a PSA that everyone should get a colonoscopy. Yeah, uh, been there. From 35 on, or if you have any issues, because it's wonderful. It'll catch yeah. anything, right? Early. and But yeah, I'm not eating anything. So if I'm like extra, because of course, I'm like, I'm not eating anything. I should get a giant iced Americano right before <laughs> this. So oh, wow. if I see what a combo. Punchy, yeah, yeah. It's but I haven't, I haven't started add to the, that the cauldron. Scary, the ca <laughs> ca ca cauldron is the right word. Um, but yeah, the scary part of the prep is later today. But of course, I have like three client calls. So I'm just already like yeah. mentally going over what I might say if just I have thinking to about, excuse myself. <laughs> just thinking about how later you're going to be shitting your pants. That's like a good way Dude, to go into the call. Yeah, that's true. All yeah. Night. So on that same, note, same as every morning. <laughs> I'm very regular, thank goodness. But oh, love, yeah, love to hear it. Right, just you like know, Jamie Lee. <laughs> I know with the Activia. Yeah, I think that's the one. Activia. Yeah, she you guys has lost me for a second. Every, <laughs> Jamie We're Lee talking Curtis. About Jamie Lee Curtis. There was a really good mm. SNL sketch about that. Do you remember where it was like right in the middle of it? She's like her stomach just starts gurgling. Yeah, and she's got to go. This well, I am a member of the IBS Girly Club. Uh, so, well, listen, yeah. do you know the author, Samantha Irby? I don't. I'm going to forward some books. Let me actually like, please treat you and buy you a couple of her audio books. <laughs> she's so amazing. She's a brilliant comedy writer. She speaks of her own memoirs, but one of her big things that she talks about a lot is her IBS. And, it makes for good comedy. But the thing is, is she's like growing up with it and what that was like. Yeah. And my whole family, we have like a litany of, of health issues that like, again, I'll spare you. Whereas I didn't get my parents IBS. I got a whole other slew of just. Mm. Thanks, thanks parents. Dad. Thank yeah. You. We all got our, well, our inherited weird things. That's for sure. I would love to talk IBS for the whole episode, but I feel like there's also some other value you could add just like in your wheelhouse, maybe a little bit more. Will you just do an intro of who you are aside from your bathroom habits? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm Kat Aranajad, and I'm the director and founder of Totally Reps. And we are an illustration and creative production agency based in Brooklyn, New York. I get to do what I love for a living, so I feel really lucky. I get to work with all kinds of visual artists. 
and advocate for them and try and help them get some great work, work with them on some great projects that they sometimes will bring to me and just also make sure they're being taken care of and looked after. Not too many rounds, that the budget is fair, that the usage is fair, chase down invoices and just generally Mm. kind of collaborate with each other. The idea of collaboration is paramount for me. So being able to start my own agency, I want it to be more kind of artist forward and a little bit more flexible, a little bit more lenient, because I think that the industry has just changed so much from when I was first an agent. And I feel like you kind of have to adapt. Totally. Two things that came up for me. One is that you said the way you said it and the way your tone of voice changed. I feel like you're an artist's mom. (laughs) I feel like that. I mean, I feel like I've heard mom, I've heard like an auntie. Yeah. Or like a big sis even. Aunties are the fun ones. They get I think the alliteration in artist artist auntie. Artist auntie. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's your shirt. Yeah. (laughs) It's a jean jacket. Maybe bedazzle. That's actually a really good idea. Artist auntie. <laughs> Hashtag artist auntie. Trademark. I, I, copyright. Seriously, copyright. All of it. I'm like writing it down. I think that sometimes there's so many good agents out there, but I do feel like that some agents sometimes get like a bad rap because there's this tendency for it to feel more formal, for example, mm-hmm. which isn't bad. That's just how some people are. I just think it's in my nature to want to form the relationships and I like looking out for the artist and I become very close with many of my artists. And I just think everyone does better when there's like that level of trust. I think trust is so key in any kind of artist agent relationship. That's actually sometimes where I find it goes south when there isn't, there's a lack of trust or Mm -hmm. a lack of transparency. And so that's really, really important for me. I'm just not someone who would do well in a more formal or structured environment. I do take it really seriously, but I really love it. And I love being a big sis or an auntie. Or oh, a I love that. Yeah. So then how did you figure out that this was the right career for you? Because I think we're coming from the other end where most artists are saying, well, I think I want to be represented. But how did you know that being an art agent was actually a career and that it was an option for you and that it was something that you would be good at? How did you fall into it? I feel like I got really lucky, honestly, because I was genuinely lost for a while. Leaving art school, I had two graduate degrees from Pratt, one in painting, and then I decided to stay longer and do art history, which P.S., that's where I met Kelly Anderson. We shared a Mm. painting studio. We started grad school at Pratt at the same time and have been friends ever since. She's amazing. I already clocked her like genius level back then. And I made her give me her art history thesis in like 2005, because it was just like, Kelly was someone who you just were like, oh, she's special. She's just on a different level. It is her way of thinking for sure. She approaches things in such a unique way. We love talking to her. You know, what's funny. My college roommate freshman year was also an art student and every freshman has to go through the same foundations where it's drawing, painting, really the fundamentals of being in the art world. And this woman could look at anything and draw it exactly as it was like photographic. I remember one of her portfolio pieces was a marble. And I was like, that's a marble. (laughs) I could pick it up. And she didn't even go into the arts because it wasn't a creative process. It was just, that's what I see. This is exactly what it looks like. And I always really struggled with the way she thought how different it was from the way I thought, because I could never make something that looked that realistic. I could try forever and it There's would never look like that. just have that specialness. And the thing is, is like, even from sharing a fine art studio with her, and then both of us did the dual master's thing in art history as well. And I was like, oh, I feel so basic. My thesis for art history, and it was fine. It was great. It was about Alice Neal and her portraits of the LGBTQIA community throughout her 80 year career. Kelly's was about like deep space and designing for deep time and what visual iconography is going to look like to warn people of toxic sites and like a thousand. It's just that next level of my brain doesn't work in that way. But going back to art school, I mean, I had a really winding path to get to where I am. I've always been a late bloomer. I think I'm just such an anxious person that it just it always takes me longer to figure Mm -hmm. things out. And so 
I got my two master's degrees. Yay. Wow. And then you're like in student loan debt. <laughs> then you have to get jobs. And I had an art studio in Williamsburg to paint and I had to let that go pretty quickly because I just couldn't afford it. And I was doing a lot of odd jobs. I was like doing some just Photoshop stuff for a PR agency and really random odds and ends. And then I, through a friend, got hooked up and became the photo and illustrations editor for the New York Observer. And so that was amazing because I got to work with so many of these illustrators that I like worshipped growing up, like Philip Burke, who always did the inside bit for Rolling Stone, which I grew up with, and Barry Blitt, Bob Grossman, Victor Juhas, Drew Friedman, just incredible people. And then I kind of just faffed for a bit and I saw a listing for an artist agent job for a UK agency called Debut Art. And I just remember reading it being like, this sounds like something I would be into. And it was basically like an illustration agent. You work on relationships with people. You talk to people. You're talking with artists. You're trying to get artists work. And I interviewed for it. And the more and more I found out about it, the more and more I'm like, this is so up my alley because I love talking to people. I love connecting people, creative makers with editorial or publishing, and then it would become advertising as well. And so I thankfully got the job and I was there for a little over a year. And it was like everything kind of just made sense. Finally, it was like, oh, mm -hmm. shit, this is amazing. I'm working and becoming friends with all these incredible visual artists. I'm a pretty social person. And I we didn't we didn't know that about you. <laughs> I just open up conversations with strangers on the subway about colonoscopies. And, yeah, that's how but, we met. Exactly. <laughs> I grew up in my mom's hair salon. And if you want to get really like Malcolm Gladwellian about it, but you learn how to talk to people and I enjoy mm -hmm. it. But I really, I've always liked being a connector. So yeah. Are you still making your own art? No. So do you ever, that? yeah, that's where I'm going. How do I feel about it? Yeah. Well, I miss it terribly. And I do have some days where I'm just like, God, why do I feel so pent up or whatever? And I realized how much in my life creating art and painting was also just an outlet yeah. in the most basic sense, not creating it for anyone in particular. I had a couple gallery shows and I sold some pieces, but I really do love it. I do want to get back to it. I think now that I'm getting in more of like middle age and I have a little bit more financial comfort and my son is older. So that opens up some time. I do want to get back to it because I really, really do miss it. I have tried playing around on an iPad Pro and it is incredible what you can do. And I'm admittedly super overwhelmed by just how much you can do. It's so overwhelming, like all the different brushes and everything, but it's just not the same for me. I was a very right. tactile oil painter. So it's really hard kind of feeling more constricted with an uh, mm. iPad Pro. But I do envy when I see artists creating work that looks just so juicy and painterly. What um, kind of art do you make when you're left to your own devices? I really probably wore my influences too heavily on my sleeve, but I really loved super kind of washy, abstracted, figurative work. And I was just always obsessed with like Richard Diepenkorn and the Bay Area figurative painters and Elmer Bischoff and Joan Brown. and. It was figurative, but in a kind of abstracted spatial kind of way, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. so I like to paint big mm -hmm. and I love oil paint. Whenever I would even try to play around with acrylic and get all kinds of glazes, it wasn't the same for me. Like mm -hmm. I'm very sensitive to the tactile thing. And I still doodle over everything. Like all my notebooks are just covered in doodles. So I miss it. I do miss it. And I want to get back to it. So I think that's part of why... I love what I do so much is because it's like living vicariously through the artists because yeah, totally. I get it and I see what they're doing. I'll marvel at their skill. I'm envious, but in like a loving way, like, oh, this is so awesome. And it just I'm sure it it's also happy. a really helpful tool to have as an art agent coming from that perspective of understanding what the artist feels like and what they're For going sure. through and what the process is like. And you see that side. Do you find that a lot of people on the agent side have that art background? Or is that something more unique to you? And have you felt like that really served you? I do think there's a fair amount of agents who do have a fine art background. And then there's also some agents who also come from like a design background, which is also super mm -hmm. helpful to have. But I do you think now having enough like years behind me and experience with different artists and different agents, I do think in my opinion, that the better agents I find are the ones who do tend to have like a more creative background, because I think there's just something that where they inherently understand 
not just the process, but what the artist might be going through. And then on the flip side, being able to speak to a client who's like, I have something in mind for this. And I'm thinking of Matisse's period of blah, blah, blah. And you can be like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, and, yeah. You know, it's just like- I have a full like, ass degree in art history. Yeah, <laughs> full <laughs> ass, full <laughs> ass. And so, and it's helpful, you know, like for my thesis, like I mentioned studying Alice Neal so much. And I just nerd out a lot on figurative work and just all kinds of styles, but it's all relative and it's just different variations. Granted, I'm in more of a commercial art space, but everyone I work with, they're proper visual artists and fine mm -hmm. artists or contemporary artists, however you want to call it. We just work primarily within this field of commercial art and commissions. Well, you said collaboration is super important to you. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how you collaborate with mm -hmm. people in your position? Sure. I mean, I think I've been trying to use that term more and more because I think that when people think of an agent, right, it can feel really, like I said, formal or more transactional. Or sometimes there's this sense that I think this is where some agents go wrong, but it's also where some artists might go wrong is where they see it as like either I work for the artist or the artist somehow works for us. And I really mm -hmm. don't like that kind of way of thinking. I think that it has to be seen as a partnership and there's no hierarchical status. You have to do this for me or I have to do this for you. I think that it leads to like a more of a toxic kind of situation. That's been my experience where sometimes I may work with an artist and they just really are stubbornly are like, no, you should do everything which it just doesn't work that way, right? Or I find that if I have to constantly explain to the artist what to do or how to do it, that also doesn't work. But when it's more of a dialogue, when we're talking with each other about maybe some strategy of what we can do, if things are slowing down, what can I do more of? What are my suggestions of what you could do? And it's the artist who also just really get that and are open to it. And like I said, there's a trust there. I find that those are the relationships that tend to have the most longevity and flourish the most. Because I think that if an artist feels like they're being spoken down to, it, that's not going to work. If I feel like I'm being spoken down to, I mean, I immediately chafe at that too. And listen, some of these relationships are not meant to work. And it doesn't mean that I'm a bad person or that artist messed up somehow. Sometimes it's also just not a good personality fit. And I think that if you think of like what an illustration agent does, or the other term for it is illustration rep, I'm here to represent the artist that I'm working with. And we are not kind of seeing eye to eye. And again, it doesn't mean one person's right or wrong. It's just like, then I'm not going to be able to properly represent you, or you're going to feel like I'm not properly representing you. And so I've also learned to just let some artists go or part ways with artists, whatever you want to say without ill will, but just sometimes it's not meant to be like in any other yeah. kind of relationship. Yeah. Katie and I both have had experiences working with and without agents and we didn't know better than to know what to look for. And I think a lot of artists expect that it's this one ticket, like golden ticket to success when really all the things you said are so important. And I think often get downplayed when people are in the realm of thinking they might be ready for an agent, whether it's a licensing agent, a literary agent or an illustration agent. And just talking about those relationships, I think is so important. But something that my licensing agent said to me was that she doesn't look for people who are brand new, even if they're super talented. She looks for people who have already dealt with several licensing contracts and have learned what it's like so that then they understand the value of her position so that they can really lean on her and create a partnership instead of a, hey, go find jobs for me. And I yeah. think that's the exact same thing you're saying. Is it that, is. So maybe you could talk more about what you're looking for in an artist. Are you typically looking for artists or are you getting so many inquiries of people who want to be represented by you that you're just sifting through those if you're looking for more? Two sides of that question. So quickly on looking for artists. I mean, I've been like a kid in a candy shop this year because mm -hmm. having to start a new agency from scratch, and I only have had the totally site up since March, but you all know me from before and I've been an agent for 14 years. And But you know what's so funny? I still struggle with imposter syndrome. And so when I was putting my new agency together and I started reaching out to artists before I even had a site up, I was like, I don't know if anyone's going to say yes, because I don't even have a site up. I don't have Instagram. 
I was surprised when everyone was like, yes. And I was like, oh, and so it's grown a lot faster than I had anticipated. And I do want to kind of pace myself a little bit, but boy, is it tough because there's just so many artists that I love and want to work with, but I am trying to keep curation in mind so that artists aren't overlapping too much. And so that's been tricky. I've turned down some incredible artists who I love, some even I know personally, who I have so much love and respect for, but it's just, it's not the wise thing to do for me, but it's been very, very tricky. And then working with some artists who are coming from my previous agency. And and so kind of combining a bit of like new people that I've never worked with and established artists I've worked with before. But what I look for is, I do think it's important to have a balance. I look at a lot of younger artists coming out who just have so much innovative styles that I haven't seen. And it's really exciting. But I also have learned that sometimes people right out of school, they're not ready for prime time, so to speak. Do you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, the talent is there, but they don't quite know what it's like yet to properly communicate with clients, how to keep me in the yeah. loop, understand how jobs work, how rounds work. So there is I, something to be said for established artists who know. I all think of this. they're also in an experimentation phase where they're going to try a lot of things. And I envy that so much. When I used to work with students, when I was an art director, we had a group of student employees and They were so passionate about trying new things. They would never say no. They would always just try it. And if they couldn't figure it out, they might ask for help, but they were trying and their style evolved by doing that. And so fresh out of school, I think it's rare to find someone whose voice has really come through their work because they're still experimenting. And that's not to say a master of their craft has already done all their experimenting, but they're experimenting in a different way with the tools that they already have perfected. And a testament to that is when I do folio reviews, like I just did this summer at SVA. I'm going to teach a class at SVA next year. Amazing. I'm super excited about that. Yeah, I love SVA. And a lot of folio reviews, sometimes I'll do, even with like master students, that age group, it's still a little bit because they're experimenting so much. It's a little bit all over the place. And Mm -hmm. so that's also the danger too, though, sometimes because, and it's always hard because I never want to discourage any artist I speak to. Even if I see where there's room for improvement, I always really make a point to be as encouraging and positive as possible. Because I have heard horrible stories about other agents or reviewers who've essentially crushed people's dreams, which makes me crazy. I just think it's horrible to literally say to someone, I don't think you have a future in this, if you can imagine. And that's been said. So I I might have said that to myself if I would have seen my very beginning art. And that would have been so sad because I got past that place. We all do. (laughs) It was bad. And and that is part of our own, whether it's imposter syndrome, insecurity, whatever. I just think it's a shame when I hear people say this to young artists. I think it's one of the cruelest things you can do. The one thing I always advise them, though, is moving forward. And if you want to get jobs or if maybe eventually you want an agent, maybe you don't need one you do want to develop what your point of view is going to be. And it's okay if it's within different mediums or whatever, but most people who are commissioning, especially within the realm, I'd say most especially advertising, they want to go for artists who have a definitive point of view. If you are too generalist, a jack of all trades or a Jill of all trades, or it's harder to get jobs sometimes. It is. And even Mm -hmm. if they're super talented, it's trickier because it's like, well, okay, let's say I can do some tight, and lettering, but I can also do these animated GIFs and I can also, and I love my artists who can do that. Where the challenge comes in is, but if you're up against a job that involves lettering, more often than not, the art buyer is going to go for someone who really specializes in lettering. Mm -hmm. As they should. As they should. As they should. And so that's why I really try and encourage younger artists to kind of hone in on what makes them them, basically, their point of view. Yeah. So something you said was that Artists need to figure out if they want an agent, if they don't want an agent. You said something about, you know, as they're figuring it out. Can you give some like talking points for when someone might not be a good fit for working with an agent? Because sure. I, I, again, like I think a lot of our community thinks, I guess it's time for me to get an agent to level up. And we all know that that's not the quick fix. An agent is wonderful and it would be an honor to work with you, but it's just not for everyone, as you said. It's like not. it's just not always a good fit. So is it personality trait? We already said it's your work needs to be evolved enough where it's recognizable and that clients are looking for you. But Mm -hmm. maybe when is it not probably a good fit to look for an agent? I'd say there's two sides of it. On one side of it, you can just be established enough and comfortable enough 
in knowing how to work with clients, knowing how much money to ask for. Maybe it doesn't phase you to have to chase invoices and you feel confident enough in your ability to push back. And I'm friends with this artist that I'm sure you all know, John Bergerman, who I often use as a case study. And John is like, he doesn't need an agent. I mean, for the traditional sense, like he's so good at kind of handling things on his own. I think he may have like a licensing agent, but he's just so adept and he's been doing this for so long. And so I understand if he's like, I don't really want to give away 25 or 30% of this budget. And that's also where it comes down to. And then on the flip side, for less established artists who might not work well with an agent, trust again, it's going to keep coming up because there are sometimes artists who, if you don't know how to kind of square, I see the benefit in having an agent. I see what this agent is doing for me. I'm at peace with handing over an inquiry that came to me in my DMs or my email about a potential job. And I trust that they're going to try and get me a bigger budget and look after me. But if instead they look at it like I'm resentful that I have to pass mm. this on to an agent, I'm resentful that this agent is going to take a commission. If you're coming from that kind of side, and I'm not judging it because the thing is, is I yeah. do understand like money is money. This is our livelihood. It's really hard to sometimes square handing off a portion of that budget. It's like a lot of mindset and personality traits coming to play. Totally. Totally. Absolutely. Interesting. And, And so some of the artists that I've had really successful relationships with, they're like, I've just resigned myself to it. I don't dwell on it. I know that you're going to have my best interest at heart. I know you're going to get a better budget than I'd probably be able to ask for. I like that you're there to step in when the rounds are getting excessive or Mm. the client has changed the brief completely in the fourth round and it's time to ask for overages and more money and more time. And so there are artists that really understand and appreciate the value. And so they've been able to kind of compartmentalize any feelings of just anger (laughs) or resentment over having to hand over a portion of the commission. Yeah. You just nailed it when you said it's really an, it's an attitude kind of thing. Yeah. Something that I started doing was thinking of my licensing work and anything like I was working on with my agent as my full-time job. And it was like, oh, my boss asked for this. And I know at the beginning you said like, it's more about a relationship, but framing it that way sort of helped me to say like, this is when it's due. Even just treating my own freelance work as though I am employed by a boss, even though it's me really helped me to prioritize to get things done. Like if you were at a full-time job, you wouldn't let those things slide. And so having that sort of respect or trust or whatever with whether it's an agent or whether it's yourself and taking yourself seriously, I think is really important. The other thing you mentioned was client briefs. And I'd love to dive into that a little bit because we've already said people assume that having an agent is the fast road to success. And I think one thing I'd like to do is define what you feel success looks like. What does a successful partnership look like? But the other thing I'm curious about is if you can share more about what does a brief look like? What does a typical project look like? What price range are you talking about? Because I think a lot of artists are thinking, oh, well, bigger clients, bigger budgets. And I don't mean to like myth bust over here, but I'm pretty sure that's not always the case, at least from my experience. I did a job with my previous agent for a very popular cooking store and the budget was embarrassingly low. And I was like, I'm going to do it. It sounds awesome. <laughs> but that's yeah. how they get you. That's, that's how, how they, they get you. It. And then they ghosted. Those little sneaky sneaks. Oh, if hilarious. you're in our licensing blueprint, you've heard this story before. And I like, you can hear my reaction. I like went back to see the final and the final looked similar enough that they could have given me the direction to change it, but they just ghosted instead. However, they did go with the artist that was up against me or whatever. And she's one of my favorite artists. So I was like kind of honored. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard though, right? Because when we are pitching or when a client reaches out to us and is like, your artist is one of three artists that we're looking at. And that's just par for the course. A lot of agencies are required to triple bid. So let's just get that out. So artists, because sometimes artists get resentful about it, like I'm up again. Yeah. And it's like, they are required to. Because we had to do that as well. At my When yeah. I was working as an art director, we had to get even for video work or yeah. for like printing, we had to get three quotes because it has to get approved that we're actually getting a deal or whatever. And it's yeah. not always the least expensive. It's just, no, it, you know, it's, it's which based one are we on getting? style. And it's also for more corporate entities, a way to ensure that no one's kind of, it's all above board. 
that right. deals haven't been struck because it has right. happened in the past. And I've had sometimes awkward situations where a couple of my artists are up against each other on the same mm. brief. I don't like it, but it happens. Yeah, I believe course. in transparency. So I tell the artists right away and I'll always make sure the budget is exactly the same. That That's way, important. It, no one has an unfair advantage. If you do get it or it's, you don't get it, you understand it's a style decision at the end of the day. And, and even though that's still a bummer, it's easier to swallow and it, knowing that no one has an unfair advantage. But yeah, briefs are all over the place. To me, it's always worth it to go for it. If you want to win, you have to play the game a little bit, right? And that's just, that's a necessary evil or however you want to look at it. But I always, and I truly believe it. I've told so many of the artists I work with who've done tests for clients, ad agencies, brands, and it can be a bummer when you don't get it, but it's always worth it. First of all, it's a great experience to go through that process. You're still making an impression, and that's a good thing. And oftentimes those creative teams may love you and your work and be really impressed, and it's not always their decision at the end of the day. Sometimes there's account managers or people from the client that they're working with. Maybe sometimes it's some suits who aren't as creative, who don't see things in the same way. But you leave an impression. And I can't tell you how many times artists that I've worked with have done pitches or tests that they did not get, but those same clients or people who are maybe at that ad agency, and maybe they've moved to a different ad agency, they've reached back out. So I think the biggest thing, and I say it so often, is in this industry, you have to respect that it's about planting seeds. You're planting seeds. If you are constantly expecting instant reward, instant jobs, instant mm -hmm. money, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to have a hard time. But if you understand that it's the long road, it's the long game, it's like when I would do portfolio shows, those didn't result in immediate jobs ever, 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 ever. I don't think once. But what it did was, first of all, I met a bunch of creatives from wherever I went. We'd connect, we'd stay in touch. That's one part of it is the relationship side. Their teams would look at books, look at swag, look at merch, like whatever. They would leave an impression. They'd hold on to something or they'd be like, oh, this artist is rad. I don't have anything for it right now. But then six months down the road, a year later, mm -hmm. they'll be like, oh, I can now reach out about this artist. So it's planting those seeds. That's such a great perspective on it. And I feel like we, especially in this moment in time, just expect results fast Turnaround gratification. Yeah, exactly. But then we're mad when we get fast turnarounds. When they're like, I need it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I can't do that. That's impossible. But we just we just expect it in this era. And we're finding this too with like on the flip side when we're working with sponsorships or doing any kind of marketing. It's the long game. That's the important thing. It's getting mm -hmm. in front of people, it's creating relationships, it's having a memorable moment with somebody that they're going to circle back to when it's the right time. Exactly. And I think that that applies across everything. And I think that's why also you're so perfectly positioned to be in this job that you're in because you are remarkably good at making those lasting impressions Thank and you. just being a very, very kind person. So it makes sense why you fell into this job the way that you did. You're great at it. Thank you. Um, oh my God, I'm a bit burnt. <laughs> but one of the things is that's so important. And I think this is where, again, looking at it from both an artist perspective, but also as an mm -hmm. agent, so much of this is about relationships, right? Yeah. And it's like, I can never get over sometimes other agents maybe I've met or worked with who it's very like, okay, the job is done. There's a cut finality. It's like cut and dry. There's no effort made. And I can't teach someone that. I think sometimes you either have it or you don't, which is why it becomes very transactional. And the same I would say for some artists where I'm like, you can chat a little bit in the email. It's not like, here is the second round. Thank you. They know. They know what's up. That's co-signing in bark language. But yeah, it's like on the most basic level of just knowing how to speak, knowing how to have social skills or just customer service for the most basic way of putting it, even though that makes me cringe a little bit. But it's like, don't you want people to come back? It's as simple as that. You want people to come back. You want people to be like, I want to work with Katie. I want to work with Alana because I know they're mm -hmm. going to be lovely. I know they're going to be professional. I know I'm going to get great work from them. And I really enjoy having conversations with them and Zooms with them. And it makes my day better. It makes my life better. It's so simple in so many ways, but it's shocking how many people just, they don't get that. And it's really frustrating. And in terms of like, I feel for a lot of artists who've also maybe had agents who don't get that or make them feel a certain way or put pressure on them. I spoke to an artist yesterday who I can't sign. She's so lovely, but we had a really nice 
Zoom chat and I just wanted to help her if I could, because that, that's what makes mm. me happy. I like that. I'm not uptight about my time or my knowledge. Like if I can help people, I want to. That's such a good point. But it's a shame because she was telling me about an agent that she had and was like, they constantly kind of made me feel bad or put pressure on me to take jobs I didn't want to take or would often just side with the client right away. And I felt like they, and that just breaks my heart when I hear stuff like that. Cause I'm like, no, we're not all like, <laughs> we're not all like that. I think you know? it comes back to the like artist auntie because a good relationship is going to be the one where someone is advocating for you and someone has your back and someone yeah. wants to see you succeed and they're willing to use their connections to help you succeed. Yeah. And they're willing to use their network and their skill set to make sure you're in a good light, to make sure you get what you need, advocate for you. Yeah. And I mean, without that, it's just going to be awful. And I can say that from firsthand experience. Oh, no. Yeah. It, I mean, if it's not a good fit, it's not going to be fun for anyone. No. And look, people can get dazzled. There's a lot of agencies out there. And I'm friends with so many agents. And I have so much respect for so many. Like in recent months, I've hung out with people from like Jackie Winter and BA. And I love having that camaraderie because we can all talk with each other and share ideas and support. But I do think it's a shame when I don't know why people want it. The only thing I can think of is it's, it's a pretty sweet gig. You know, you get to work with artists, you can make a decent living. But I really do question sometimes why people get into agenting if they don't enjoy that. Honestly, mm -hmm. like it's anathema to me. And this woman I spoke with yesterday, an artist I speak to a lot, who I know right off the bat, I'm not going to sign them or I'll even say to them, I can't right now, but let's talk. And like, I shared with her a list and I've done this a lot with a lot of artists. I'm like, you need to get as many agents as possible. And sometimes I felt like I'd get in trouble for trying to push artists to get more agents because I don't believe in being like mine. I think it's better for the artist. Why shouldn't you have as many people worldwide pushing your work? I think that mm -hmm. the more people see things from like a place of a lot, there's enough for everyone. What advice would you give to an artist like the woman you were talking to yesterday, maybe their style isn't as evolved. What advice would you give them if they think an agent is right and they've done the hard work of figuring out, will I be okay with not, with having sort of a an auntie who's very involved in the process and who's helping me and giving me guidance? Or do I really like the marketing and the outreach and all that? What would you tell an artist who wants to get an agent? And yeah, what advice, where should they start? Should they be Googling? Should they be on LinkedIn? Should they be sharing their work online, what are like three big bullet points for them to walk away with before just sending emails to people? The first is to make sure that your online presence is where you want it to be, that your website is up to date. So not their following. I just want to clarify, not their, not following, their following, their portfolio pieces should their be really, really strong that they're yes, proud of. Exactly. Listen, I always look at an artist. I do look at their Instagram. Mainly for me, I don't give a shit about the number of followers. It irks me. It really yeah. is my pet peeve. And I really try and tell artists, and I know it's easier said than done, please don't stress about the number of followers you have. Please don't. Mm -hmm. And believe me, I get the frustrations. Like mm -hmm. even for me starting my own company, I've like realized, oh, I need to pay Instagram to boost this post just so I make sure eyeballs <sighs> get on this post <laughs> because it doesn't make sense why there's like six likes yeah. or something on something. But what it tells me, though, is that an artist is being proactive and pursuing this as a mm. career. Instagram is like I often refer to as it's the window display of your store, kind of, right? Like your store, your brick and mortar is your website, is your portfolio. But I kind of see it's much easier for me to see the latest thing you've been up to on something like Instagram or LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, more and more and more, I'm seeing artists and I'm encouraging my own artists to post on LinkedIn. And it makes sense. You know, I saw an artist I was so lucky to be able to rep, and I'm lucky to call a friend, Aurelia Durand, who mm -hmm. we both know. We met her in person less. Oh, at Adobe. At Adobe, Adobe Max, Max, we met her. We took yeah. her session too, and she's just lovely. And, and she, she showed us how to animate. Right? Yeah, she was actually our Fresco. first speaker yeah. at the conference, it's which amazing. I feel awful because we had every technical difficulty and she oh. had to bear with me. But we did figure it out and her session was wonderful. But yeah, she's so talented. She's so, and she's so good at what she does. I'm not sure she even needs an agent, but I had noticed. And when I saw her, we both were at DNAD. We were both on the illustration jury this past spring, which was super fun. And it was great to spend time with her again. And I was, and I noticed like she was posting more and more on LinkedIn. 
And then it made complete sense because if you think about it and depending on how you connect with people, and I have like a lot of LinkedIn connections and they're all within the industry, right? It's not just people coming across your Instagram being like, I like this art follow, but the majority of the people are commissioning people or people from mm -hmm. ad agencies, brands, whether it's like Vans or Nike or Kiehl's or Lush, or it's like ad agency folks, right? And so those are really good eyeballs to have on your work. So yeah, yeah, losing another, LinkedIn more and more. Yeah. Another good example is David Owens. I don't know if you know him. He's yeah. upstate New York by me. He is a LinkedIn machine and he doesn't have to show up on social media. He's on LinkedIn, he's sharing his work and it's led to so many incredible opportunities like national parks posters and his work is already refined. So he's not just throwing, throwing like caution. To, he's not just like throwing spaghetti at the wall. He's consistent yeah. because his style is already created and he's getting to, yeah, he's crushing it. It's and smart. I admire it's so that. smart. I, I do too. And I'm like, of course, when you're posting on LinkedIn, you're not going to necessarily post what you would post on Instagram. Like here's this awesome bowl of pasta I had last night too. You know, it's like you're posting specifically for a professional capacity. Mm -hmm. And so it's much more kind of like hyper directed at the eyeballs yeah. that you want on your work. So it makes complete sense. And so I've been doing that too. And it's been working out very well. And so, but I just like to see that. So an artist has their shop ready, right? Like the website is in a place that you feel comfortable with. It is up to date, same that you're showing that you're doing this regularly, whether it's on Instagram or Behance or LinkedIn. So that's step number one. Then the next step is really grow a thicker skin in terms of self editing. And what I mean by that is, is mm. I think that there's a common tendency for a lot of creators to feel like I just want to show everything I've done that I feel good about. And I found that that just backfires. It's like yeah. quality over quantity. I'm not saying only have 10 things, but don't have 100 things really try and refine as much as you can, so that it best represents who you are now and the work you're doing now, or at least the work you want to be doing. So take a kind of tough microscope in a way to your own folio and be like, okay, let me streamline yeah. this a little bit. That's Absolutely. okay. I'm not going to lose jobs because I'm streamlining my own That's great portfolio. advice. Do you like to see explanation behind portfolio pieces or projects that people have worked on? Do you like there to be copy or do you prefer the images just speak for themselves? I think it depends on the kind of work because sometimes there is a relevant backstory there mm -hmm. of like, I tackled this heady topic with this kind of thought process and this is how I created this piece. Sometimes that can be really valuable. But generally speaking for me, I just really like to see the artwork, which is why mm -hmm. I also always preferred Instagram over let's say Twitter. Like I don't want to read a bunch of mm. like quips. I just want to mm -hmm. see the work. And even in my- Cat, interview, it's like, X. Get it right? X. <laughs> it's X. Yeah, I think that's, that's something- <laughs> That people, <laughs> that people overthink a lot. That wasn't uh, my colonoscopy prep, by the way. So. <laughs> Just to specify. Yeah, we recently did a whole webinar on portfolio sites and how to optimize and yeah, just all the overthinking and the worrying about over designing your portfolio website when the work really should speak for itself. I think people really get hung up and then they kind of freeze and then that leads to not updating for yeah, years. It's a and preciousness. I call it a preciousness. Yeah. People get really precious that it has to be perfect. And I'm here That's to tell you, to please just relax and just post the work. And the same goes yeah. for social media. I think there's this feeling that people feel like anything I show has to be super refined, super finished. And honestly, sometimes it's just so nice to see like a doodle you do yeah. on a sketch yeah. pad. And, and like, that's really changing yeah. with like TikTok and just the way that people want to see content. Mm -hmm. They don't watch the really refined stuff that people have labored over and tried to make look perfect, but they watch the I'm in my car talking mm -hmm. while the audience is terrible. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you too. I mean, we've seen more and more, whether it's on TikTok or Instagram, whatever, it's like a process. And you two yeah. post a lot of, I can't get enough of a process. And I have found that it's funny, whenever I've posted my artist processes, is that the correct <laughs> plural term? Yeah. I'm a no clue. Going. All right. I think so, so people respond so much. And I think it's also because like we said, everything is so like instant gratification and there's so much visual quote unquote content. And that people can forget that like a human hand is behind it. And so there's something just so mentally gratifying. Maybe it's visual ASMR. I don't know how you want to like get ready with me. What, it's like get ready with me, but art, right? So it's just very satisfying, at least for me, 
and I suspect for a lot of the people I work with, to just see the process of how a finished piece comes to that stage and from a sketch or an idea and erasing and starting over. It's just so weirdly rewarding. But like 60 watch. seconds of it, not like 20 minutes of it. Thank you. That's actually, <laughs> thank you, actually, because the other day I did watch something and I was like, ah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. and then you're just like running out of steam. So yes, uh-huh. I do think yeah. there is something to be said for keeping it short and sweet. Yeah. I think a minute, minute and a half mm-hmm. is plenty of time to time lapse speed <laughs> yeah, for process, sure. ideally. Unless it's this like is, some kind of giant Game of Thrones right. set design situation that requires right. more, but it doesn't. Yeah. But then each one can have their own 60 second explanation yeah. and that's your whole feed for a year. Anyway, exactly. Uh, this is so helpful. I think people are going to find a lot of value in just hearing from an agent what it's like, what you're looking for. Can you do a quick recap of where people can find you and connect sure. with you? Sure. The website is totallyreps.com, just like it Love sounds. It. And the Instagram handle is just at totally reps. And my personal one is bonjour cat with a K around LinkedIn as well. (laughs) I look at all submissions through submissions at totally reps.com. And my personal email is just cat with a K at totally reps.com. And I really do try and I've been trying to get back to everyone who writes to the submissions folder. It's hard. It's kind of my weekend thing where I just relax and like listen to music. I'm always making playlists and. I really try and get back to them. It's hard that it's getting harder, but I do like people to know I've seen it and I appreciate it. And there's so many times where it really physically pains me. And was it you, Katie, who we emailed when I was at Snyder before? Me. Or like, was it you, Alana? It was me. I, I submitted to you and I was very new, like a couple years out of school, I think. And I really didn't have my style. And you were so generous with both your time and your advice. Your work was so good. You're I very mean, sweet. Thing, like, I it mean, was, it was great. That's what sometimes, and it's hard because sometimes I'll see work and be like, oh shit, this is really good. But like, I have sweet. like these three people on the roster and it's like. You did, you had Southern Angela, who's. I miss- oh, Angela Southern. There you so go. That's her quote thing, her yeah. Instagram handle. And and Jill, I think Jill you know, I, Yes, and I really too. looked up Love to both Jill. of them. I really looked up to both of them. And so it was really, it was an honor to like hear, okay, keep going. It wasn't like a, hey, your work sucks. Go figure it out. It was a, hey, great job. Keep it up. I never got a response like that. I would hope. No, no. I don't, I mean, I don't think people are like innately mean like that, but that's what every person thinks they're going to get is like, either you're great or you're not good enough. And that's truly not what it is. It's do I have clients who are asking for this style? Does it fill a void? Do I have the room in my capacity to take on more artists and how would I be pitching them? What type, where would their work be a good fit? Do I have yeah. contacts in that realm? I mean, if I could sign every artist I loved, it would just be chaotic. It would be like <laughs> a 300 person roster. But what I would just say to the practicing artists out there who want to do this for a living, you go into it, it's going to be a little bit of a roller coaster. This isn't like a nine to five thing where every day you're going to have an inquiry and every day you're going to have a job. It's just going to go up and down as it does for me as an agent. And to just kind of, listen, if you love what you do, you just keep going at it and keep working on what you do. But I also just really want to encourage artists to, like I said, don't be so precious. Just post stuff, just share stuff, show people who you are, show people what you're even into or what your influences are. It's about creating that kind of connection, right? And, but also don't put pressure on yourself to feel like you have to fit a certain mold or be doing exactly what your favorite artists out there are doing, your peers are doing do things your way. And sometimes that's so scary to just be like, I want you to have an attitude of just fuck it. I'm going to do this my way. And either people will respond or they won't. And you know what? People will respond. Like have that kind of faith in yourself to be like, I'm only going to work in red for like the next year. And maybe people will think that's weird, but I guarantee you people will be like, that's fucking awesome. Are you looking at this artist who's only doing shit this way? Like, And they know who it is. They're like, yeah, the girl with the red. (laughs) Yeah. Just be comfortable. The people I've always looked up to within this industry and even outside of the industry, right? They just do things their own way and they become respected for that and admired for it, not kind of cast off or like, you're never going to make it kid. And even with myself with totally reps, I've just wanted it to have more of like a fun, irreverent feel from like the logo 
to everything else. Like that, I don't care if it might even some things might come across maybe unprofessional to some. I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> like I've really that. learned this. I don't care. I'm just going to do it my way, and people will either respond to it or they won't. And I'm not going to sweat people who won't respond, and you shouldn't either. You I know, do things for you that make you happy, that make you like stoked in the morning to like do what you want to do, and the people will follow. Such great advice. I think that's perfect advice to end on too. I feel like it definitely lights a fire and sets people in the right direction. So thanks for coming so. on. I appreciate you guys, thank it. Thank you so much for having time. me. And I just, I just want to shout you two out because like, <laughs> I, I love you two. I love what you both do. I love that you both inherently, again, it's that attitude of like, I really love helping other people. I really love showing other people how to do this. I would love and want to share with people what I did to find success because believe me, not everyone is like this. I love what you two do and you two are absolute advocates, but like sharing you. your own experience and successes and trying to bring other people on board for it. It's so beautiful. I'm so happy you two have the book coming out. Literally, I think I put a message. I'm like, you two are doing a service because you really are. I mean, you two are essentially also like the two awesome aunties, right? <laughs> Who are showing people the way, but in a way that's so inclusive, lacks judgment. It's just valuable. And I'm always pointing you two out. I'm always taking advice on my end from you two that you both will post about, talk about. I love your podcast. Like I said, I was sitting like, yes, this is what, this is what I need to do. Ooh, I've done this. Oh, and I appreciate that so much. And I talked to you both too when I was starting out totally. And it was just you two were like the wind beneath my wings. <laughs> and now, honestly, honestly, so just so supportive, but like, watch out for this, do this, make sure you've got a good CPA. This is the software to use for like project management, like all of this stuff that I was just inhaling because I needed it. And so thank so you sweet. too so much. Aww, honestly, thank you. That means The so love is very hear. mutual. Mm -hmm. Katie, can you take us out with a little wind beneath your wings? <laughs> you are Fly. the wind. <laughs> you Fly. are the that oh you I don't have a match. I'm just, this is my make believe. Candle. So good. So good. My okay. All right. Candle. My That's lighter. It. I love yeah. you too. Thank you so much. Come Thank again. you. Come again. Thanks Thank you. Man. I'll be thinking of you all later when I'm in like the depths of <laughs> my colonoscopy, colonoscopy prep. <laughs> I always want to be thought of when they're like <laughs> five feet deep up your bum. You know what? I'm going to be so, I'm going to be so high tomorrow. Do you two want to know what I put on my autoresponder for tomorrow? I don't know. Do we? <laughs> I just, I need to share this with you. I don't know if you're still recording because I was cracking. I was making myself laugh when I was writing it, but I was like, again, I'm just going to be radically like myself. So I have an autoresponder for tomorrow and I just wrote, hello, I'll be getting a medical procedure done today. All is A-OK -okay and will be unavailable before 2 p.m. as I'll be floating in space on gloriously powerful sedatives. <laughs> and so... I, I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to even more I'll be candid. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I was tempted. I'll be spreading I was with tempted. A, a camera up my bum. I was tempted. But then Are I had to finish wind it like under <laughs> that, under, under my <laughs> flaps, under my nether regions, <laughs> under my nether regions. So I just, wow. I ended it with like, I promise I'll get back to you shortly when I'm lucid enough again to reply professionally and articulately and essentially not fully zooted and yammering on oh about God. space manatees and how much I love you. Oh, wow. that's adorable. Well, enjoy. Enjoy tomorrow. Enjoy the sedatives. I will. And thanks for coming on. I love you both so much. Thank you for having me.